Welcome to the Real Chili Podcast. And the Golden Eagles of Marquette University in Milwaukee are bound for the Final Four for only the third time ever. Five seconds left. Marquette down by one. Trying to avoid the upset. Blew the drive. The left hand. It's good. Every day, as basketball players, as students, and I want to win every day, most importantly, as people. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Real Chili Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Lavender. I'm joined by Brian Henry. And yesterday, Marquette fell at Seton Hall, 69-66. Brian Henry, it's been a while since you've been on the show. Good to have you back on, but under such bad circumstances, we've got a lot to talk about today. Hang on, what do you mean we lost? I, I had to I had to take off with like 30 seconds left. It was over. Oh boy. What do you mean? It, it was a hell of a 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I kid. Uh, that was as disappointing a finish to a Marquette basketball game that we have had in probably the better part of four or five years. The fact that it really felt like we had something on the line. Granted, early enough in the season, nothing massively. Uh, the season's not over. Nobody's complaining about that. But wow, that hurt. Oof. It did. And we've said this on the pod before. We've said this recently. Marquette's in a position where we need to get those 50-50 games in the Big East when you're talking about Georgetown, Seton Hall, Providence. Those are the games where we need to at least split with some of these people. And that's what makes this hurt even more is because throughout the game, it was a great game. There were positives and negatives for both teams. It really came down to the last minute, last 30 seconds even. I don't know if we can attribute it to one specific person or one specific grouping of people, but it fell apart there. And, and I look immediately to rebounding. Seton Hall is good at rebounding, and, and they beat us down low there for those several and ones at the end. There are a few inexcusable sins on a basketball court. Um, I won't label them all off, but uh, at the very top of that list, uh, to me, is not blocking out on free throws. It will happen every once in a while, and if it does happen, it can only be once. You cannot give up multiple extra chances. When, when you've got four guys in the lane and they've only got two, you know, that just... I mean, it just killed you. You, I mean, you. And you could see the way we reacted almost looked like the way they reacted, Mike. You could see the body language drop. You could see their energy fall apart. Like you, you could just feel they were like, oh, God, we blew it. And you're like, ah, there's still 15 seconds left. Come on. Mm -hmm. Don't turn the ball over twice when you had a chance to go down and, you know, redeem yourself. Just... Oh. It, w it was a complete collapse. And, you know, like I said, throughout the game, I, I thought there were positives and negatives, but it came down to those last 30 seconds. I think there are people who need to be leaders on this team, both on and off the court. And off the court is one thing. On the court, we don't have our leaders yet. Georgetown game, it was Marcus Howard and Juwan Johnson, but they can't do it every single night. Marcus Howard had a good game. Juwan Johnson did up until a point. He had a, he had a number of missteps there towards the end. You know, I, I think we need more out of our seniors. Mike, I I, th I really don't think you have to sit there. I, I think you're right in in that you're 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 looking at it from a, you know, okay, our lead. It's what wasn't there. We weren't there in crunch time. It's as simple. Sam Hauser and Luke Fisher can't give up an offensive rebound when the other team's shooting a free throw. You can't do it. I'm not pinning it and say those guys played well uh, for stretches. We're gonna get deeper into Sam here in a second. I thought Marcus Howard up until that final. 30 seconds, uh, was, was masterful, especially with how their game plan, and we'll dive into this too, was almost predicated on taking advantage of him. Seton Hall showed him absolutely zero respect with when he brought the ball up the floor, and he made him pay a few times. He turned it over a few times too, did some freshman things, but he hung in there. Uh, that felt like at halftime, I was like, dear Lord, Rousey might play the entire second half. And Marcus came back and played a heck of a second half. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll get into the specifics on them, but we we can't separate it. That last 30 seconds, multiple offensive rebounds on the free throw line, two turnovers when you finally did get the basketball in your hands and never got a shot off. We I don't think we even crossed half court. So you talk about those two turnovers that we had. There was uh, one specifically by Jawan Johnson. I don't think that one was necessarily his fault. That was a heck of a defensive play by Seton Hall. They had their hands in the right spot at the right time. It was a good strip. Now... That's not defending saying that's okay for that to happen. It shouldn't happen for, uh, you know, a senior on your team who you're going to for a play like that. 
the Marcus Howard turnover there with nine seconds left. Unacceptable. That was unacceptable. That was much more iffy. It shouldn't have happened. And here's what I don't get. They trapped him all game when he brought the ball up the floor. And he got out of it all game. 90% of the time, yes. He did a much better job of it. That's pretty good for a freshman against the track. Yes, but the point being, as I alluded to, uh, Seton Hall game plan to, we are going to put that guy in tough spots because we don't think he can handle it, is basically what they said from the opening possession of the game. And the fact that in the down three with the ball with seven seconds left, whatever it was, to watch him just dribble the ball off the floor and not anticipate that that was going to happen again and get surprised by it was, I just, you know, I I just got done texting somebody two minutes ago about how patient he was and smart with the ball when he found Caton on the baseline to put them up by three, and then he turned around and did that. I guess that's kind of the definition of freshman in college basketball. They can look great one moment, and then they leave you scratching your head the other. That was the definition of it. it that didn't lose the game. Free throw line stuff is what ultimately did it. But it was unfortunate they didn't even get a shot at the basket uh, on two possessions to redeem themselves at the end. I mean, that's what made the whole – it wasn't just the foul line stuff. It was, dear Lord, we couldn't even get over the ball over half court. Again, keep reiterating it, as disappointing a loss – uh, which is good because it means that we had expectations and we were right there. But as disappointing a loss in four or five years. Yeah, very disappointing loss. And now we're faced with the task uh, of going on the road to play Villanova, which will most certainly not be an easy task. Let's not dwell on that yet. Let's not, yeah, we're, we're going to stick to this. <laughs> I think there are positive this game. It is super easy to zero in on that last 30 seconds, and not wrongly so. There, clearly, that is where we ultimately lost the game. But if you look throughout kind of the last – 10 or so minutes, there were so many opportunities, so many wasted possessions, so many silly turnovers. Not too many bad shots by this team. I I think we've, it looks to me like we're progressing away uh, from bad shots. I think there were points earlier in the year where I would go back and watch film and every single one of Caden's shots, I said he was thoroughly contested or there was a terrible off balance shot. That's trending in a better direction for Caton, and that's not just because he uh, hit all those threes in the first half. But I think in the last 10 minutes, yes, you can pin it on the final 30 seconds, but that wasn't the only reason. There were opportunities for us to be much further ahead uh, than just three points uh, than we were towards the end there. Let's run through. You, you already started doing it. Let's run through some look at some of the individuals. We can start with Caton. Uh, I like him coming off the bench. I think that is a role that I enjoy seeing him come in because of his ability to do what he did. He came in and went into complete Kate and Reinhardt heat check mode and kept us afloat in the first, not just kept us afloat, uh, but gave us a, te- a he was the only one. He was the only one rowing. He gave Yeah. He gave us a double digit lead in the first half. And the only reason that first half was close by the end, because we went cold for a stretch there in the first half is because of his shot making, you know, did, did he end up taking in the first half, a couple stretch threes, but you know what, when you're that hot, I'll, I'll give him a pass on that. Now, in the second half, you know, he keeps shooting the ball like I am, you know, in his head. I, I'm still that hot, uh, so I'm going to keep firing. He took a three in transition uh, in the second half from the right wing, which I think many of you remember, which had to have been from 25 feet where he raised his hand, called for it from Marcus. I think Marcus was stunned when he shot it. He was more just kind of starting the offense and entering to the wing, and, and he caught and fired. He, he I'll say this, though. That's Caton Reinhardt. He did what he is supposed to do. We got we got more from Caton Reinhardt in that game than I think we expect to, which is why it puts you in a position to steal it. I think one of the main reasons that Caton is now coming off the bench, and I don't disagree with you there, I think one of the main reasons is uh, his defense is lacking at times. I think earlier in the season, uh, certainly a non-conference play, defensive rotation on pick-and-roll defense was pretty – was straight-up poor. In this game against Seton Hall, I thought it was really good. I thought Sam Hauser was really solid and rotating defensively. Luke Fisher was okay, better than he has been, so I thought some of those rotations were pretty solid. When Kate and Reinhardt entered the game and started hitting those threes, it's easy to look at, okay, three, another possession, three. Interspersed in there on the defensive side of the ball were some boneheaded plays by Kate, which he should know much better than, which really led to Seton Hall being able to at least stay within striking distance of the lead that we were building. Mike, wouldn't you say that we've reached a point now, but that, that's what we're going to get from him. We're, we're 14 games into the season. We, I, th- I think that's what we expect. We're, we're going to get things that are going to have us 
you know, putting our head between our legs with Kate with Caton, but he's going to give us moments uh, like he gave us in the first half. You just have to roll the dice with it. That's there's a reason why he's been at three schools and you know in in five years. Uh, there's a reason you know he has scored over a thousand points. He's a high volume guy. He is what he is. I think he did exactly what we brought him here to do, and he's going to have some drawback to it. Uh, while he does it. You made a great point, though, in kind of transitioning there uh, regarding Sam Hauser. I think Sam defensively in the first half, I, I couldn't get over it. I mean, it looked – No, he's great. Compared to the Wisconsin game where he got absolutely picked on, some of his picking – the whole team, but him especially – Well, Seton Hall's not Wisconsin, so let's, uh, let's say, that, you know. Fair enough. No, no argument. But I'm just saying I watched him play an above-average team who – specifically ran him in pick and rolls and forced him to rotate and he couldn't get to spots. Granted, yes, this is not Wisconsin, but he they Seton Hall attempted to do the same thing, picking on him with how they put him in pick and roll and forced him to rotate when the ball, uh, you know, went from wing to wing. He did a terrific job as did his teammates. I thought in the it, throughout that game and that was why even though and this allows me to uh, transition it to I thought Sam struggled to get his shot off for large parts of that game. I thought uh, Seton Hall was conscious of him as a shooter, and they made it very difficult uh, for him. Now, he's still, when you look at the final stat line, he had 11 points, 4 of 8 from the field. You go like, yeah, you know, he was he was solid. I think there was opportunities there. We needed 15 to 18 points out of him in that game. Uh, and he just, there were possessions where plays were ran for him. He couldn't get it. But because of how good he was defensively, that's why he didn't come out. He played 33 minutes. That if I will take that Tied for most minutes on the team with Juwan. Exactly. I Mike, I, I'm curious what you think. I think that was almost more encouraging. You know, jumps. You know, we saw him score 19 points against Georgia. We saw him score 19 points against Fresno State. He has the ability to do that. I'm not saying he's going to give you 20 every single game, but it's in him. It's absolutely in him, and I agree. The thing you need to come along, the thing that Sam Hauser was the best player on his high school team, a great high school team. He knows how to score. Defense is something that clearly needed to be coached early on, and he is picking that up. This game is a signal of that. If other players on the team, particularly our freshmen, I thought I think Marcus Howard has improved in that area somewhat. Not perfect. No one's perfect, but he's gotten better. So I agree. Entirely encouraging to see Sam Hauser come along in that aspect. Another player who I think is continues to be solid defensively, but for one reason or another uh, has lagged offensively, is Hanif Cheatham. Hanif Cheatham went 0 for 5 from the field in this game. I, the first thing that comes to my mind was the missed layup there towards the end. Hanif has always been, in my mind, someone who finishes around the rim. Simple. Over the past several games, though, I don't know if you want to call it the yips. I'm, I'm starting to call it the yips. Just around the basket, he can't seem to finish. Again, still great defensively, and I think he was in this game, too. He's a great perimeter defender. Um, he can body up. He's tough. He's physical, uh, maybe a little bit beyond his size. Um, but his offense just hasn't been where it was. And I think he's one more piece that when he kind of comes along a little bit further. Something just doesn't make sense. I'm just, I'm just going to look at his last five games. Against Wisconsin, 6 for 14 from the field, 16 points. Against St. Francis, 6 for 12, 18 points. Against SIU Edwardsville, 8 for 10, 19 points. Start of Big East play. 35 minutes on the floor against Georgetown, one for six, three points. 30, 29 minutes on the floor against Seton Hall, 0 for five, zero points. So it could be chalked up to teams know he's a threat. They played him last year. They know where he's coming from. And teams are probably saying, and granted, small sample size, only Georgetown and Seton Hall, they know Hanif Cheatham's skill set. They saw it last year. They got a lot of tape on it. They're saying, okay, freshman, Sam Hauser, Marcus Howard, you're good. Prove it to us. Right, lock down Cheatham and let the freshmen do what they can, and and we're one and one. Did it feel like that to you in that game, though? No, no, it didn't. Did it feel like if it felt more to me? What I watched in that game personally, I watched them very rub hard on screens against Hauser, and I watched them very aggressively challenged Marcus Howard bringing the ball up the court. Those were the two guys that looked visible to me watching the game, where it was like they have a very clear. We're going to take advantage of that guy. I didn't get the feel watching Cheatham in that game going, God, Seton Hall is doing everything they can to take him away. I'm not saying the yips, but he he looked hesitant at times, and he didn't look 
like a major threat to score for large parts of the game. And, and same goes for the game against Georgetown. Now, granted, other guys were hitting shots. You had two guys go for 20 against Georgetown. So maybe it got to a point in the second half where I was like, I'm just deferring. I'm feeding Juwan and Marcus. They're taking shots. They're on fire. And that will happen. Like, your best players will have games that don't score a ton. Against Seton Hall, it looked weird. He was out there, but it didn't look like he was out there, if that makes sense. I, I agree. And I think what's weird is that you see him miss things consistently that he hasn't in his entire career at Marquette. And I think that's what jumped out. He is our best transition finisher without question. And I think we're having a different conversation. This is not saying he did it, but before we got to that final 30 second stretch, there were two huge plays and it was a pick and roll with Kate and Reinhardt and Luke where Kate made a terrific pass to Luke. He tried to dunk with two hands, jump from too far away, ball hit the back of the rim and kicked out. We got a turnover coming back the other way, and our best transition fi- finisher, Hanif Cheatham, shockingly, I-, I couldn't believe it, didn't finish, just missed a-, a layup. Now, it was in transition. He's moving full speed, but that- for him, that's it might as well have been uncontested. That's what he does, and he missed it. And it, now, great. And and then the, there were defenders there, so it's not like right. Everybody saw it. it. It wasn't an uncontested layup. I get it, but but I'm saying, knowing what we know about him, he always finishes those. Yeah, yeah. Like that is his. Well, his skill set is finishing in traffic and at the rim. Like that, it was just shocking to see him miss it. You know, you brought this up several times about how Seton Hall essentially just challenged Marcus Howard and said, "Okay, we're going to press." Uh, they did it in the first half. They did it in the second half. Just watching the game. I thought Marcus Howard handled it very well. If I'm Seton Hall up until the final nine seconds, you know, the last play in the final nine seconds, I don't think Seton Hall considers that an effective strategy against Marcus Howard. But looking at the box score, he had five turnovers, and that surprised me a little bit. Going through the game, it didn't add up. Yeah, they got him more in the first half than you probably probably you probably remember because there's a reason why Rousey came in as early as he did. And when, if you're, when Marquette went on their big run, which is when, when Reinhardt came in as well, that was Rousey who was on the floor leading it. So that Marcus was sitting on the bench, and I remember I was seriously I remember texting everybody at halftime, uh, the fine people you hear on this podcast, uh, that I was like, wow, I wonder if we're going to see more of Rousey in the second half. Not that Marcus was bad per se, but it was just he came in and jump started everybody, and you could tell they were picking on him, mm-hmm. and uh, and and Rousey did a pretty nice job breaking their pressure when they tried to pick on him. Props to Wojo, props to Marcus for coming back in the second half. I thought that second half was his best half of the season. Uh, I thought he handled their pressure well. Uh, I thought he was good defensively. He hit some huge, huge shots. That four-point play, three-pointer, that, that that was the moment where I thought we were You know winning. what that reminded me of? That reminded me of that Jay Crowder and one three-pointer uh on the road against UConn a few years ago. That, 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 that oh, like yeah. That light tape of. Great memory, yeah. Yeah, absolutely huge play and huge cojones for a freshman. I mean. If, if you're going to take it down to one possession, Mike, the, you know, after those, uh, we just talked about Fisher and Cheatham's misses, under a minute, you're up by one, you need a great play. Seton Hall played terrific defense uh, on that possession. Howard ends up with the ball in his hands with seven seconds on the shot clock. It's running down. He probes and finds uh, on a great cut by Reinhardt, finds him cutting baseline and gets a layup. That was an incredibly mature, smart play for a 17-year-old point guard to make. Incredibly mature. You know, one thing kind of pouring over the stats here, we've highlighted this before, Marquette is the number two team in the country in free throw percentage behind only the University of Notre Dame men's basketball team. However, we are downright abysmal at getting to the line. Five of six from the line against Seton Hall. Great percentage actually bumps us up a little bit. Not nearly enough to get not, not getting not to the line enough. Getting the line nearly enough. And I you know, that's probably a product of the fact that we shoot so many threes, there's not as much attempt to get into the hole. And maybe I think, you know, it's part of the solution for this team. We've we've all seen those games where against quality Big East competition we try to get in the lane and it usually doesn't work that effectively. From game from time to time it will. We need to rely on threes. But we can't solely rely on threes the way we are. And Luke Fisher's not getting the ball down low. True. We're, we're going to get into Luke here in just a second. But it, it, it ties into a point we just made. Who's our who's who's the best player on our team at getting to the line? Hanif Cheatham. And Hanif, Hanif Cheatham doesn't have the ball in his hands, and he's not attacking the basket. We're not going to go to the free throw line nearly as often as we need to. I think I think we're still going to shoot. The problem is he only he only took five shots in the game. 
And I, I don't, and I can't remember all five. I can remember the last one. I can't remember the other four if they were even going to the basket. An opportunity for him to get fouled. I mean, that's the thing. I don't like, think he took a single three. I think they were all going to the basket. Point being, the fewer touches he gets, the fewer times we're going to go to the line. Not entirely on him, but he's a big part of it. So if he's not engaged and he's not scoring, he does a lot of his scoring from the free throw line. He leads the team in attempts and he leads the team in free throw makes. We got to wrap up here in just a few minutes, but you just alluded to it. And I think we need to talk a little bit about Luke and talk a little bit about our front court. We alluded to this. I don't know, Brian, if you got to listen to the previous episode, which you weren't able to make it on, but we did. Mike, if I'm not on an episode of the pod, it is, I, I may be your first downloader and first listen. It, it is, oh. it is must listen podcasting must listen content hey our, our listeners are going up every week so yes if you're not on the bandwagon already get on the bandwagon but what we talked about in the last podcast was we discussed how at the beginning of the season and even in the preview pods when we were talking about this who's your bet we said luke fisher's our best player we need to get him uh the ball he, he shoots incredibly high percentages we need to get him the ball more often we are saying that late in the non-conference season and even in the past two games it feels like there's been a shift to a more guard-centric offense. Clearly, these guys and uh, these guards, even some of the freshmen, are getting older and more experienced under their belt. But given Luke Fisher's skills or lack thereof or lack thereof presence in the post, I think we're going to continue to see uh, a more guard-centric offense as we continue through Biggie's play. Because to this point in his career, Luke Fisher hasn't proven that he can be a dominant enough presence down in the post during the Big East season. And I think that's going to continue. Well, you did remind me of something from the previous pod, and I'll, I'll shout out my colleague uh, Peter Worth here, but uh, I, I wanted to jump through my speakers and, uh, <laughs> and, and knock him over uh, when I heard him say, you know, I believe his line was, the hope is for Luke to be a 20 and 10 guy. I don't know where that came. You did say that. I no 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 no. Oh yeah. On the preview pod, oh, I will cue up my words. Oh, maybe you said fifteen pod. and ten. My th- my my best case scenario for him is fifteen and eight. That's what I think he is. I think his at his peak, he's fifteen and eight. I'm twenty and ten. Ninety nine percent, sir. You said fifteen and ten. Fifteen and eight. I will. I will. You will. Pu- we'll cue that up. We'll get. We'll tweet that out for the people. We'll find my audio on that. Fifteen. Twenty and. T- I mean, I. I don't know where that came from. I don't think he's that good. I mean, he, he, I think he's a nice player. I don't think he's 20 and 10 good. Uh, my point from watching this past game, a lesson on him, I I really don't think, Mike, that they, he was used that inefficiently. Teams have him at the top of the scouting report of, of taking away his post-ups. Seton Hall has better post players. That Delgado, oh, what I would do to have him on this team. Uh, he did a terrific job guarding Luke when he did catch it. Uh, Luke hit a couple. He scored a lot of buckets on offensive rebounds. Uh, and, he, and he got. And I think he scored four or six points off offensive rebounds, which is you got to have. 12-7 and seven is not – he was there – by the end of the game, he got to the production uh, that he needed. Although I will say, looking at his, his line, this – I can't believe I didn't notice this during the game. All seven of his rebounds, it says, were offensive rebounds. How in God's name is that possible? He didn't grab a single defensive rebound. Wow. A lot of tippins. I, I think that tells you that he had good position and he had a lot of tippins and, and, and frankly, that, that our guards were missing a lot of bunnies. I mean, that's a, that's a heck of a day on the offensive glass. I can't believe he put up a goose egg as a defensive rebound. I don't know how I'm just noticing that. That's awful, but um, I'll, I'll take the seven offensive boards. Holy smokes. He, he was what he was. I, don't, I, I wouldn't turn to him as... Mike, he has to shoulder. You didn't answer the question, so I understand you didn't say 20 and 10, and I agree with that. It doesn't feel to me, and and maybe it's not backed up by this stat line, it doesn't feel to me like he has the production or the focus in the offense that he's had. And I don't think that's necessarily because they're denying him the ball. Uh, I just don't think he's going to get as many touches, whether – uh, rightly or wrongly, I don't think there's enough touches to go around where he's going to get that production. And he's not necessarily proving that with his post play to me. I, I think it's a tall order to ask. I don't think he has. I, I think the because, you know, Matt Helt's the only other big on the roster and Sam Hauser's the biggest. Rouser and Reinhardt are the two other biggest guys that he plays with. And they don't really take a ton of pressure off him around the basket. Uh, and I think it may, I think it's easier for opposing teams to defend. To offer some sort of credit to him, looking big picture, Mike, he averaged uh, 11 points as a sophomore. He averaged 12 last year, and right now he's currently averaging 13. So his his production, and he's averaging over an assist a game and over a block a game. I think he's doing 13 and six boards a game. I think we'd like it to maybe be a bucket higher and a board or two higher, but 
I, I can't turn to him and say he's not playing his role. I think he's doing. I think he's doing what is asked of him because we need because he's got to be on the floor. I think we both agree. Of ever, as important as it is to have Marcus hitting shots and Jawan, if Luke Fisher got hurt tomorrow and couldn't play, our ability to play our ability to play defense is turned on its head. I would I, I would actually say that Matt Helt could better replace Luke on the defensive side of the ball than on the offensive side of the ball. I would be more worried about the offense. No argument there, but Luke is a little quicker and he can block shots. Yep, agreed. Helt yeah. Helt gets to spots and he gets you know he, Helt is. The coach has done a very good job of Matt Helt getting to a spot, standing up like a tree, getting both arms in the air so that he doesn't foul, even though he, I think he still had two fouls in the last game. Uh, but Luke is good at challenging shots around the rim. He's got to be out there for defensive purposes. I'm fine with the way Luke's playing. Uh, we just got to get a couple other shots to go down uh, around him. I mean, keep doing what you're doing on the offense on the offensive glass, big fella, because that's going to give us a chance in a lot of games. And to, I know we got to wrap up, Mike. And that, I think I think that brings it back full circle. We gave ourselves a chance to win this game in the crunch time moments. It was there to take a road win in the Big East against a team that smacked us twice last year. And we puckered and let it get away. Yeah, we did. We did. We most definitely puckered. And I think one of the most exciting things to watch for the remainder of this season with this team is the freshmen, the young kids with little experience. What are they going to do throughout the remainder of this season? We're going to be in a situ- We're going to be in another 50-50 game before long. I still have hopes for this season. I think we're trending in the right direction. One of the things that we pointed out last time was the character and identity that we played with. And I know those are amorphous terms, but I think we had that again this game too. And that's an incredibly positive thing from my point of view that this team is gelling to a degree and forming around an identity. Can they translate that into wins? That's the question. Look, they get to turn around and play Seton Hall again in uh, uh, nine days from when we're recording this podcast right now. Uh, They get to play Seton Hall again on January 11th. So you're going to get another shot at them. You know that it, that's right out there. Now, in between, we're we're gonna all have to uh, sit and watch uh, them take on the number one team in the country on the road. Which uh, I bought my bottle of Jack and a pack of cigarettes, so you know I'm excited for that. And then after that, DePaul at Butler at Creighton, and then home against Nova. I mean, the sketch. Look, not to sit there and keep dwelling on it, but there was a big reason why you wanted that second win. Uh, because there are going to be some victories that are going to be very tough to come by. But, Mike, you already alluded to it. And I'm mo- what I'm most interested to see as you go forward to Nova, I'm honestly got a most interested body language because that team looked devastated at the end of the game, which they should have been because they fell apart. Are they going to, what are the first five minutes against Villanova going to be like? Are they going to be excited? Are they going to be aggressive? Are they going to come out playing? You're playing with house money. Nobody expects you to go in there and win. You know, can you give yourself a chance? Maybe, maybe not. But if they come out and get the doors blown off them, I think from the get go, I think we'll all be pretty disappointed by that. There you have it, folks. Uh, we went a little bit over time today, and there's a lot to discuss in that last 30 seconds of the game from our loss at Seton Hall. As Brian just said, we've got a tough schedule coming up with at Villanova and then Seton Hall at home. Plenty of opportunities in the Big East Conference to reestablish yourself and get quality wins, and that that next one's coming up against Saturday when we go to Villanova. Brian, any final thoughts before we sign off here today? I think we've said all that needs to be said. It's a tough one to swallow. You move on. There are plenty of other opportunities for big wins, and uh, hopefully they can learn how to steal them and give themselves a chance. The the chance to get your resume to make tournaments out there, but uh, you got to go take it. All right, sounds good. Good to have you back on the pod today, Brian. Hope we can have you on more frequently. It's a pleasure. It was a it was a rough uh, rough couple weeks for holiday travel and work travel and. I'm back now. I'm locked in and uh, watching Marquette basketball. 2017, we're back. All right, folks, thanks so much for listening to the Real Chili Podcast. We'll talk to you next time. 